Hello, today um, we are studying American March composers, starting with uh, John Philip Sousa. This is John Philip Sousa, and his nickname is The March King. This is a video that's going to tell you all about John Philip Sousa. <laughs> Hi, I'm Aaron Killian for Historic America, and the music you're hearing is the creation of John Philip Sousa, America's March King. Apart from a bald eagle eating an apple pie, there is nothing more American than a Sousa march. The story of John Philip Sousa begins here, the house where he was born on November 6, 1854, on G Street Southeast in Washington, D.C.'s Barracks Row neighborhood. Sousa's parents were immigrants. His mother was Bavarian and his father Portuguese. At the nearby Marine Barracks, Sousa's dad played the trombone in the U.S. Marine Band. So Sousa grew up around music. When he was six, he began studying an array of instruments, including violin, piano, flute, cornet, baritone, trombone, and alto horn. Eventually, Sousa fell so in love with music that at the age of 13, he actually tried running away to join a circus band. But his father didn't want him becoming a carny, so he instead scored his son an apprenticeship with his own marine band. Sousa stayed with the group until the age of 20, then struck out on his own to pursue a career as a violinist. He worked in vaudeville and traveling theater orchestras, even performing in D.C.'s own Ford's Theater on occasion. Sousa's talent was plain, and he eventually began composing and arranging his own music, inevitably becoming an orchestra conductor of some stature. In 1880, Sousa's former group, the U.S. Marine Band, offered him the job of band leader, and the 26-year-old accepted. Behind me stands D.C.'s Marine Corps Barracks. It is in this place that Sousa became the American musical legend we know today. During his 12-year tenure as U.S. Marine band leader, Sousa turned the group into the world's finest military band and simultaneously began producing the best-known marching music in our country's history. He once said that the perfect march should, quote, make a man with a wooden leg step out. Sousa was a wonderfully patriotic American and a very religious man who felt that the inspiration for his music came from above. He was also a perfectionist with a great symphonic sense. He weeded out the mediocre musicians from his band, decreased the brass sound to equal that of the woodwinds, and incorporated many outside influences in his compositions, from Viennese waltzes to the ragtime music of Scott Joplin. The style of march he created is instantly recognizable, even today. Among his best-known works are The Thunderer, The Washington Post, Semper Fidelis, and of course, Stars and Stripes Forever, which was designated the official march of the United States of America by a 1987 Act of Congress. Sousa would serve under five presidents as Marine band leader, and he even provided the music for Grover Cleveland's wedding while in office. Under his leadership, the Marine band also began touring and soon became a household name. After leaving the Marine Corps in 1892, Sousa kept on working as he formed his own civilian band with which he traveled the world. Audiences flocked to see his group perform, and it is no exaggeration to say that Sousa was the biggest musical attraction of his day, achieving a Taylor Swiftian level of fame, as big as Elvis before Elvis got really fat. Sousa's band was also the first great recording sensation in American history, as their popularity coincided with the phonograph finding its way into the homes of average citizens. Between 1892 and 1931, Sousa and his band played over 15,000 concerts, and he never spoke at a one of them, preferring instead to let his music speak for him. During his busy career, Sousa would compose 136 marches, 10 operettas, write three novels, one autobiography. He developed a new instrument called the helicon, but which we know today as the sousaphone. And he was such a good marksman that he achieved induction into the Trap Shooting Hall of Fame. No joke. Ever the workaholic, Sousa once quipped, quote, When you hear of Sousa retiring, you will hear of Sousa dead. This prediction would come true when he died of heart failure at age 77, shortly after completing a rehearsal for his signature march, Stars and Stripes Forever, in 1932. He was laid to rest here, in Congressional Cemetery, in his hometown of Washington, D.C. Every year on his birthday of November 6th, a graveside celebration is held in his honor, featuring a performance by the U.S. Marine Band. And this is fitting, because beyond any tombstone or statue, Sousa's greatest monument is his enduring music. Thank you, 
John Philip Souza, and thanks again to everyone watching. We hope you had fun today and that you learned a little something. So I thought that was a pretty good <clears throat> biography of John Philip Souza. There's a lot of kind of funny things in there, but also some interesting uh, just facts about him that uh, were not as interesting when they were written down. So that is why I played that video for you. Um, this video is uh, Sousa can, speaking and conducting on the radio in 1929. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. This is John Philip Sousa, and I'm very glad to be here with my band representing my own country, America, on this international program. When the Bond Bakers asked me to transcribe my voice and my band for this unique occasion, I was greatly honored because I realized, as Mr. Taylor has said, that some of the finest bands in the world have been engaged to play for you. I hope, however, that you will enjoy hearing me again as much as I always enjoy playing for you. I've been asked to begin with a march that is an old favorite of mine. Maybe you will recognize it. <laughs> was a really interesting recording um, because not only did we get to hear John Philip Sousa speak, but because we got to hear a recording of a band that performed in 1929. That's like 90 years ago. And uh, recording was just being invented then. 
And so I think you can hear um, there's lots of things in that recording that we would say were not perfect. Um, there was a lot of tuning issues. There was some uh, just not 100% together. And who knows whether it actually sounded like that or that's a recording issue um, just from having inferior recording uh, technology. But I thought it was really, really interesting just to hear the difference between recordings back then and recordings now. Our next March composer is Carl L. King. 